After more than 30 years in operation, the Waimanalo Gulch landfill on the west side of Oahu is slated to close in 2028. But the city needs to figure out where the new landfill will go by the end of this year. A commission charged with picking a new site recently rejected several options that were opposed by the Water Board due to possible effects on groundwater aquifers. Now what? Tonight's live broadcast and live stream of insights on PBS Hawaii start now. Aloha and welcome to Insights on PBS Hawaii. I'm Yanji Denise. The Waimanalo Gulch Sanitary Landfill was first opened in 1989 and is located off Farrington Highway just past Ko'olina. According to the city, about 250,000 tons of waste goes into the landfill each year. About 72% of that is ash and residue from H Power. The city has been ordered by the State Land Use Commission to open a new landfill and shutter the current one by 2028. However, a decision on where where the new landfill will go is due by the end of this year. There are only four areas on Oahu that comply with local, state, and federal regulations for a new site. A citizen committee that's helping to choose the future location recently scrapped proposed options, but ultimately it is up to the mayor to make a final decision. We look forward to your participation in tonight's show. You can email or call in your questions, and you'll find a live stream of this program at pbshawaii.org and on the PBS Hawaii Facebook page. Now to our guests. Roger Babcock, Jr. is the director of the Department of Environmental Services for the city and county of Honolulu. He previously directed the city's Department of Facility Maintenance. He holds a Ph.D. in civil engineering, and prior to working for the city, he taught civil and environmental engineering at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. Nicole Chatterson is the co-founder and executive director of Zero Waste Oahu. The nonprofit provides resources and education on ways that people can cut down on waste. She has a degree in environmental science science and policy, and a master's in environmental anthropology. Kieran Polk is the executive director of the Kapolei Chamber of Commerce, which works on behalf of members to improve the regional and state economic climate to help businesses in Kapolei thrive. She spent the last 16 years of her career focused on the West Oahu landscape and is the editor of the annual Kapolei magazine. And Raquel Achu is the vice chair of the Neighborhood Board for Oahu's North Shore, where she was born and raised. She's involved in a variety of community efforts, including the protection and proper use of lands. Thank you all for being here tonight. We really appreciate it. Um, Kieran, I want to start with you. Why do you think this, uh, this facility should close and what has the impact been on your community? Well, you know, Yinji, for we've endured this for, as you mentioned, over 30 years and it's it's been one after another after another. I mean, originally the landfill was um, slated to close in 2004. And so it's definitely past its earmark time. Um, I think our community is is been patient enough, and and they're just they're tired, and it's 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 time to to make a change. And we're we're the growing second urban core. When we have had twenty percent growth in the last decade, and we have a, a, all of our growth is um, in our city is actually moving out to the Kapolei region in terms of economic development. So. It just makes sense that it's time to move move our landfill into another area and look at alternative alternatives. Roger, let's talk about those four sites that we identified in that graphic at the top. Um, those so far have been rejected for a variety of reasons, but why were those in particular chosen? And if not there, then where? Yeah, thanks, thanks, Yunji. That's an uh, important question. So there are certain restrictions on where a landfill can be located. Um, some of the ones that have been around for a long time is it can't be located in a tsunami inundation zone. It can't be located within 10,000 feet of an airport, the outside of an airport. That's about two miles beyond the uh, outside of an airport. Um, then there, an Act 73 passed in 2020 by the state legislature, and that further limited um, place some additional restrictions. The first one is that it can't be lo located in any conservation land area. And the second one is uh, it can't be located within a half mile um, of any residential property line. 
So that one in particular eliminates uh, large, large parts of the island. And um, we do have an interactive map on our, on our webpage for the uh, Landfill Advisory Committee. Um, that's uh, honolulu.gov forward slash Opala forward slash new landfill. And there's all kinds of information, of course, of, of their activities, all their, all their handouts, recordings of all their meetings and stuff like that. But it does show you the limits of what's available. Um, what's left basically is a lot of the middle part of the island, which is agricultural areas. And um, because there they're, they're just isn't residential and it's not on the coast and there, and there aren't airports. Uh, so that's... Um, those, that's why the, there's actually six sites, uh, kind of four areas, as you mentioned, um, and in one of those areas, there's three sites that are kind of close together to each other. Um, so that's what we're, we, so legally, that's kind of what we're, what we're limited to. Um, so, yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm, and I'm looking at that picture right there. And uh, Raquel, I want to go to you because two of the qualified areas are on the North Shore. One is in Waialua, the other in Haleiwa. We see that on that picture right there. What are your concerns about bringing uh, a facility like this into your community? Where do I start? Um, naturally, the initial concern is there is uh, an aquifer that this landfill would either be on and or around. Um, obviously, a landfill will take a lot of space. Um, that area is also not as vacant as most would think it is. There are farming farmers up there, um, people living on the lands up there. That is a huge concern as well for them. Um, another large concern would be the runoff of just last year, March 2021, 20, we suffered significant flooding. Um, a lot of runoff from up on the mountain, and um, the runoff from that landfill could be detrimental to our community. And it would end up in the streams, possibly within the community again. So that would be an additional um, concern. Also, the North Shore has a significant amount of cesspools still. So any leakage or runoff could impact those and also impact a part of our, our, our near shore environment. So there are quite a bit of uh, angles, you know, there's a multitude of uh, concerns and, and the infrastructure of what a facility and traffic, daily traffic would take in that area. We just don't have it. We don't have that infrastructure. Um, I think it's just definitely time to look at different alternatives. I mean, we're gonna run out of land soon and we're not farming it if we're putting landfills on them. So I think there's definitely alternatives. Um, I spoke with someone recently about, um, I believe it's Chatham, Massachusetts. It has a um, alternative option. I'm not super familiar with it, but it seems very successful where you drive in, you drop off your lightly used recyclables, second stop, your wet um, garbage. And when you come out, you can pick up compost. The wet garbage would be used for composting. So it was something that was of interest. I think it, it's a huge, it would be a change, obviously. But, um, you know, the North Shore Neighbor Board has not taken a position. We were just kind of watching what the commission was going to decide, and we're super grateful that um, the sites were dropped. However, it doesn't eliminate it, I don't believe. I think it's still kind of floating in the air and we wanna be sure that those concerns are heard. Um, you know, our community, we had a landfill years ago. It got closed. So we're, we're kind of full of rubbish already, <laughs> so. Nicole, let's, let's build on that and talk about some of the alternatives. Do you think that we need a new site or could we continue to use the one we have? Hmm. I think where that conversation starts is on the upstream end of the waste we create. So I tend to think about the way we make waste and then the way we manage the waste we make. And I think most of the exciting possibilities that would help mediate, or remediate some of the impacts communities are going to face if having to host a landfill all lie upstream. So these are making different choices about what we buy, the products that we're importing into our islands, and 
ensuring that we can reduce the volume of waste that goes anywhere. Uh, I think the landfill may technically have capacity to continue on, and I don't know that that means it should. Um, as Kieran was saying, the community has hosted that landfill for three decades, and that's a long time. Uh, I also think we're going to run into the, the situation that Raquel brought up, which is no one's going to be excited to host a landfill. And that leads me to believe that the, and, and rightfully so, right? No one's water should be impacted. No one's land should be used that way. It's a, it is a social justice issue. It's an environmental justice issue. And, and if we do site landfill somewhere, the communities need to be compensated for that disamenity. And we need to really think about what that looks like. So that's not really an answer about what should happen. But the piece that excites me or feels like possibility here is doubling down on waste reduction so that we don't have to keep making these terrible decisions. I mean, Kieran, I think that no community wants this. So what do you say to communities who are faced with this prospect? I know that you, you know, your community is basically saying, we've done this long enough. But what do you say to others who are like, like Raquel who is facing this? No, I mean, it's a very valid point. I mean, that, that NIMBY acronym of not in my backyard, I think we all have that, that sense about it. But at the end of the day, um, you know, we do need to make other alternative choices and, and, and even look at things differently um, and, and address that. I mean, do we really need to, to have a landfill with that much of an imprint? Or do we find ways through reduction or alternative recycling, reuse, um, and even regeneration into energy? I mean, explore that in the long term. But there's no perfect answer for that. And no one, you're, to your point, no one's going to be exactly thrilled and, and happy for it. But we can't just keep kicking the can down the road either. Um, because that is one thing my, my community is very concerned about at this point with no solutions, that it, this is going to be extended and extended and extended because it could be. And that's not the right answer. Right, and there has been some talk about changing the designation so that uh, the at least would go beyond 2028. When you hear that, what goes through your mind? Oh, it it's it's very disheartening and it's very upsetting. I mean, I don't think I don't think the West Side really knows the gravity of this, and it's been very quiet to this point. But I can guarantee you, when the word does get out. That if that were to happen, it, there will be some voices that will come forward. It is very, very strong, strongly felt um, across. Like I said, I have 200,000 residents in West Oahu, and we're growing, and they all care. Mm -hmm. Roger, um, you know, those 200,000 residents also are part of the, the issue that we face, right? That they're all, we're all producing trash. No one wants us in their community. Uh, is that 2028 deadline absolute? Could it be extended? And what, under what circumstance could it be extended? Well, I, it's always possible to ex extend deadlines, and the city would uh, have to uh, go before the Land Use Committee and, and, and request that. Um, you know, um, and, and just to let you know about the about the process, so um, landfill advisory committee was put together, um, and they started meeting in October of 2021, and they're scheduled to have uh, eight meetings. They've completed seven meetings, and so there is still one more meeting, and and that meeting will involve the completion of their final report and recommendations. Um, they did indicate at the last meeting, uh, the seventh meeting, which was just April 4th, um, that. Uh, at that meeting, they completed their scorings and essentially the rankings of the six sites, which was part of the process of their, of their evaluation and, and voting. Um, uh, and at that same meeting, though, they did say that um, um, by a vote of all the folks that were at that meeting, that they were not, would not recommend using any of the sites. Uh, that said, the sites have been ranked, so we do have a, a ranking of the, of the six sites. Um, and they were asked uh, to um, evaluate the six sites on a set of um, 17 different criteria. Um, some of those are objective criteria and some of those are subjective criteria that they get to whatever they feel. And uh, so the first step of that is they were presented with that criteria. They kind of agreed to the wording of them. 
and then they uh, gave weights. They each assigned a weight between zero and 100 for each criteria. So they assigned a weight. An aggregate weight of all of their weights were, was put together for each criteria. And they ranged from, uh, for objective criteria, they ranged from a high of 92 as highest of, of importance. And that was related to groundwater, over, no pass on the Board of Water Supplies concern. Uh, down to um, the, the lowest weight was um, uh, how long it would take uh, to, to, to open a landfill. Another one was cost with the two lowest ones. That that's not an issue. It's more about the location. Uh, and then there was subjective criteria. The highest rank one was near ecological areas, ecologically sensitive areas, uh, and surface water that also came as, as very high. And then the lowest was um, things like near commercial areas uh, and uh, obstructing of view planes. Mm -hmm. And so then they were asked to uh, rank each of the six sites um, as uh, one through six um, for each of those criteria. So then these numbers were all uh, multiplied together and added up, and, and, and then the highest scoring ones, uh, what were one through six, were all, were all created. Um, and so, you know, so that's the, the process. And then, um, but actually, you know, it's not done. They haven't written their final report and said what they want the mayor to know about this process and about what they think. Um, but as you said, it, it did make news that they had said they're not, they don't like any of the sites. Right. And so that's a problem because if the board, if they're saying water is the biggest concern, we've seen obviously with Red Hill how much our water has been impacted. We're currently under a drought and you look outside, uh, the hillsides all look pretty dry considering the time of year it is. So yeah. um, given that, the, that the Board of Water Supply has basically said none of these sites are a go by their estimation, uh, do you have to go back and find new sites or do you have to work with these six? Well, it'll be a combination of it'll be a combination of things. Um, I think the the main thing is the the, the first thing that needs to happen uh, is to have the committee you know, finish their work, and um, so we're not really doing anything right now to that would um, influence you know that process. Um, so so we're, we're 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 waiting for them to finish their work, which will be in June. And then we will figure our next our next steps, depending on exactly what they recommend. And now, because they have talked about a lot of other s potential sites and other things that uh, they would like us, the city, to look into. And um, so I think we're, we're kind of just waiting for that that process to happen. And I would note that um, landfills um, have always uh, been around, and uh, one part of the thing that uh, a couple of parts I wanted to mention about what the land landfill advisory committee has done is initially they they took tours of age power and the landfill and like your picture shows it, it, my, it, the picture the video that was shown is pretty is pretty accurate um, you know you see a truck there what you don't see is birds and you didn't see trash really blowing around it, it's it's mostly an ash landfill and ash it's it's has it's cooled with water, so it looks like cement. It's gray cement-looking material. So it isn't necessarily what you think of uh, when you think of a landfill um, and what you might see on TV of some other landfill somewhere else. Um, and the other thing is is that um, uh, one of the things that we, we showed them was the, the location of 45 previous landfills you know, on the island, and they're everywhere. So uh, just so people know, uh, everybody has hosted landfills. Um, and um, uh, some of them we still uh, maintain in closure. We have to maintain them for 30 years after they're closed. So anyway. Um, I appreciate that. And I want to get to some viewer questions. I'd like you to take this one, Nicole. Um, Casey on Facebook says, how much of this landfill garbage is from and will be from the 10 plus million tourists? Is this landfill just yet another hidden cost of over tourism with the taxpayer residents getting stuck with it? Mm -hmm. Is there a way to perhaps engage our partners in our community, be they commercial, um, obviously us as individuals, uh, to reduce some of the trash in the way that you're talking about? Yeah, and, and that's a really interesting question. I know in 2020, the volume of waste going to landfill did decrease, which was aligned with a decrease in visitors, as well as a decrease in local commerce. People weren't out buying as much, although you could argue more restaurant takeout was happening, and maybe that, you know, it, it's hard to say exactly why the volume of waste decreased, but it did. Um, and it was aligned with visitors stepping back from visiting. 
So I think that points to, one, the ability for us to reduce it can't happen and how that is attached to the way we participate in the economy. And our visitors are, are responsible for the way they participate when they're here. And I think there's a ton of room for education. I mean, while on the flights into Hawaii, and I know there's some work being done there, any restaurant you go to, you know, learning about the local food options. Local food helps decrease uh, packaging waste, which is a big portion of what's in our waste stream. Uh, when you, so in 2017, the city undertook a waste characterization study, which is pretty cool to look at if you wanna geek out on numbers. And the, one of the largest portions of what is going into H Power and then ultimately into Waimanalo Gulch is food waste. So it's about 20% of what's in there by weight. And something else I find really interesting is plastic film mix is in the top 10 most prevalent items going into the landfill. So this is like plastic bags, um, wrapping from, you know, uh, shipments that might have come in, that plastic wrap that goes around containers, it's food packaging. So when looking at what goes in there, I think it's exciting to think about how to incentivize our commercial sector to package product, products differently and ship products differently. That's all within our uh, the realm of possibility. Mm -hmm. And one last thing I'll add there is there's a bill that's made it most of the way through the state session HB 2399, that's an extended producer responsibility bill. So it's asking large producers to please bear some of the cost burden that right now um, the public is here is really taking care of in managing this waste that they're producing and, and shipping to the island. Hmm. Raquel, I want to bring you back in. I'm interested, if not in your community, where is this appropriate to go? I mean, not to put you on the spot that you have to come up with that solution, <laughs> but um, no matter where we go, we could find someone from that neighborhood to come on this program and tell us why their community is not right to host this. So what, you know, we are going to produce some trash and, and we, as we noted at the top, 70%, 70 plus percent of that is the ash from H Power. So that is, um, you know, obviously we could reduce what we're burning, but that is already waste that has been converted into energy. So what, do you, what would you say to other communities? Why your community in particular shouldn't be the one? I, you know... <laughs> Being that we're on an island and space is just limited, it I would support any community that didn't support it. <laughs> so it's I think the obligation or the the uh, the idea would be to get really alternative and come out of the box and look at different um, alternatives. How other um, states are able to get away because there aren't. I, I realize landfills have been something from the beginning of time. That's just the way it is. But I do believe that there's probably new ideas, new technology, new systems that can be uh, implemented in maybe a facility type of operation that would minimize taking away the land for rubbish. Once we do that to the land, we seriously compromise our ability to make that land sustainable for ourselves. And that's pretty critical because we keep talking about being sustainable, we're on an island, we need to be, take care, but we can't do that if it just keeps becoming a dump. Uh, Mark in Kailua has a question, and, and I think that I, actually this is a good one for you. Uh, Kieran, she says, or he says, can the city realistically find a new site by the end of the year, given that the, the group that he's talking about has had seven of the eight meetings, has rejected all the sites, the Board of Water Supply says no go. Um, you know, you, you're going to have advocates like Raquel arguing in the same way that you're arguing that it shouldn't be hosted by them. Uh, do you think that the city can realistically figure this out I have my doubts I mean I, I've, I've, I've been sitting through the last several committee meetings as well and watching this and and there's a timeline and, and to Roger's point I mean there are certain things that need to happen um, that's not to bode the point that it should be extended and extended and extended but we need to think proactively and we need to to look at this and say okay if this isn't the solution then what is because you know just pushing it back and pushing it back is not going to solve and and to your point about uh, about um, the you you were talking about 
finding ways to reduce. And, and I think our visitor industry, that's an excellent. I mean, regenerative tourism, it's on the top topic of what, what is being said. And there's a connection there. There's connections that can be made and, and solutions that can be found. So I don't think it, it's very realistic. And if, it, if there is um, you know, one that's selected, it, it's obviously there's repercussions in different, different areas, whether it be the Board of Water Supply or a community that is up in arms about it. So I don't know. There's, a, there's a two qu comments here on the military, and Roger, I wonder if you can take these on. I honestly don't know the answer to this. Um, Moses in Nanakuli says, what percentage of the state's waste is coming from the military? And to follow on that, Eddie says, are military lands considered in the land fight, uh, landfill site selection? Yeah. Um, the, uh, I, I honestly don't know the answer to the first question either about military, uh, the military waste. Um, they're, they're rubbish. Uh, with respect to um, military lands, that, that, that's a good point, and it is it is shown on the on the website on the sites that are available and not available. And so, um, federal lands were were not considered, so that would include military lands. Um, the uh, the reason for that was that um, there it's not considered feasible with the with the timeline that we have um, to get an agreement or um, uh, have the. The military, for example, say, yeah, we don't need that land. That seems very unlikely. Um, and uh, there's not that much space which um, would also would also meet all the other criteria that we have. Um, some there is some large military areas that are on the west side, which aren't, which isn't wouldn't be a good alternative. Um, and uh, you know, I one of the things that we um, didn't talk about, we talked about Waimanaw Gulch. Um, about half of all the waste generated on the island is construction and demolition waste, C and D waste, and that all goes to a landfill called PVT, which is in Nanakuli, right, right off Farrington Highway. Um, and that um, landfill uh, is, is unable to expand anymore. And so it, ha it may have five to 10 years of, of space left, and then it will be closing. Uh, partly because, mostly because of Act 73, there's residences, residences in the area. And uh, so at that point, um, unless uh, something else happens that's very unlikely, then all of that waste will be coming to the city as well. So our new landfill that we, have site, uh, that we are siting, and we have the alternate sites, and we've sized and shown them. You can look on the website and see where they are exactly. Um, are, do consider all of the c and waste plus all of the ash from H power and the small amount of uh, municipal solid waste that goes directly to the landfill, as well as special wastes that go to the landfill, white goods, um, materials from uh, cars that are scrapped, that's called fluff, and various other things that, that can't, be, can't be burned. Um, but just to let you know how, how big it is, um, the site of the landfill, so the landfill is sized to last 20 years, um, is 80 acres in, in a footprint. Um, so to give you a perspective on that, a typical golf course is about 110 acres, 110, 120 acres. So it's about two thirds the size of a golf course. Um, but that's the that's the pile, <laughs> uh, and then there needs to be a buffer. So if you put a half mile buffer around there, you end up with about 500 acres. Um, and when we talk about you know appropriate areas or inappropriate areas. Um, it turns out that that central part of the island, um, which does go all the way to Haleiwa, which Haleiwa came out number six, um, <laughs> and still is from Kunia to Haleiwa, is the most open space where there's no people. Um, uh, a lot of it is, is fairly flat, um, but it is in agriculture. So it is, it would be one of the negative things, of course, is it would be a loss of, of productive agricultural land, actually the best land that we have. Um, how, however, it, it's not zoned residential. There is nobody supposed to be living there, and it is far away, you know, from people. And, you know, with respect to the uh, farmland, um, there's it's in what's called important agricultural lands as a designation. And there's A and B, and A is inactive cultivation, and B is is um, suitable for active cultivation. There's 136,000 acres of that. Um, in in that area, and um, you know, and the landfill is, is would be 500. So, uh, we at the ledge we, we made that you know made that comment. It's less than one half of one percent would be unavailable. Um, so that's not that's not important. But um, 
we do feel it's it's a, a fairly small uh, amount and uh, so anyway that's uh, but however it is over the potable it is over a potable aquifer everything's over a potable aquifer pretty much um, but uh, but anyway that but that isn't a, that isn't a legal restriction the uh, potable aquifer part when you hear about that scale of land when it's less than one half of one percent what do you say there is the North Shore does have a vast amount of land and um, I'm hugely protective of the ag land there's a lot of uh, misuse of land as it is we do have um, quite a bit of a, a variety of different issues that come and hit our ag lands and um, trying to support and implement programs for uh, farmers and uh, people who even live on their lands to farm it, it's hard to get those people to commit when you know at any time it, it's there's always a consideration of developments or landfills or whatever whatever you have um, I, I the, the amount of land that you're talking about and number wise sounds amazing if you were to go out there and look at it, it's not, I don't believe is that feasible for a project such as a landfill. I, I think for the North Shore, obviously the um, protection of the aquifer is a huge, 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 huge um, point. We, we have too many water concerns. But I'm just gonna throw this out there as a different angle is, as to your point of the, um, reduction in waste during the pandemic leads me to think maybe there's a carrying capacity of this island that needs to be considered and that's out of the scope and probably another meeting but obviously something to be considered in terms of use and what we're producing and how to manage it better that's a completely like i said out of the box kind of comment but you know things that we have to think about ultimately that help us reduce that waste and be able to manage it better in an alternative means versus just putting it into the ground. And I think that conversation is one that is ongoing on this program and others about just how many tourists we can really take. But I appreciate you bringing that up. Um, I wanna bring these two questions to you, kind of building on what she was saying earlier about finding alternatives. Um, Dave and Mililani says, does the panel know of any new technologies and waste management that could be tried at the new location instead of just digging a hole and dumping rubbish in it? And Kosuke says, how do other island communities in the U.S. and around the world deal with this program? Are there solutions that Hawaii can model? Hmm. In my opinion, the low-hanging fruit would be removing that 20% of our waste stream that's food from the picture. So we're not going to talk about burying it. We're not going to talk about incinerating it for energy. Instead, we're going to reincorporate it into soil. Uh, maybe some of it goes to anaerobic digestion to create energy and then there's soil outputs after that. So there's, there are great technologies, low tech and high tech, for dealing with the food portion of the waste stream. And I don't know that any of those are particular to island communities, but they are abundant in many other places. Uh, a couple s legislative sessions ago, we modeled a potential solution to our lack of composting here after what Ohio was doing. And the so the Department of Health in Hawaii is the entity that uh, says yes or no to composting facilities. And there's a long and arduous permitting process, which is arguably a good thing, um, but not many, not many entities have made it through, and that's because some of the ways we're thinking about food waste are a little antiquated, and some of the risk we've associated in our policies with composting is, is, not, is no longer um, serving us and is no longer accurate. So Ohio did a great job of tiering their composting permits. So if you're doing a little composting project at a school, that's one type of permit. If you're doing a big facility, that's another type of permit, because obviously they have very different potential impacts. 
Uh, so if we can get something like that going, there's no reason why every DOE school couldn't have their own composting pile, which is educational for kids and is solving uh, a, a big piece of our problem. So that's, that's an easy low-tech solution that just requires a policy shift. And that's very interesting, and it builds on this question from Laakea on Maui, who says, any plans for a commercial composting of fa facility? Many recyclable materials are being landfilled due to the absence of such a facility in Hawaii. Building on that 20% that she's talking about, tell us about some measures that are under consideration that could help with food waste. Sure, yeah. So thanks. The, uh, as, as, um, as Nicole knows, we, uh, the most important thing that we can do is source reduction. So we really have to change as a society what we, the, way, the way we deal with, with our waste, and that's how much we produce. So I mean, I just want to make sure that that's understood. We have a, what's called an integrated solid waste management plan, and it's a required thing to have, and our latest one is from 2019. And number one, um, number one it's in order of importance. Number one is source reduction. Um, and it's easy to say, um, but you know, zero waste Oahu, um, they really have you know ways of doing that. Um, you know, you you buy food in bulk. You know, you don't you don't uh, buy things in bags. Um, you and, and there's various other things, various other ways as well. And and we have also our uh, disposable foodware ordinance and stuff like that. But but I'll come back to that. But in terms of composting, right now all green waste, everything that goes into the green bins is composted. So that's a very large commercial operation that is located in central Oahu, uh, in the Wahiwa area. Uh, so that's where all green waste goes, and that's made into compost at uh, Hawaii Earth uh, Recycling. Um, so the, um, so f food waste, though, currently, as, as we all know, it goes in your gray bin, right? That's where you put your, where you put your food waste. And as Nicole mentioned, correctly, that's 20% about of the weight of, the, of what goes in there. So, you know, one of the questions, but again, this, this is just talking about residential. So there's also the whole commercial side, mm -hmm. restaurants, hotels, et cetera, have a lot of waste as well. And uh, we, don't, we don't collect that waste at all. Um, so that's, that's all done, you know, by commercial services and uh, including their green waste and any other, whether they collect mixed recyclables or not. Um, as well as cardboard and other, you know, any, anything else. Um, and so uh, some of the, that green waste does end up being composted. Now, what happens to the food waste? Most food waste uh, ends up going to our, um, to the uh, pork production industry. Uh, it goes to piggeries. It makes, it's made into slop food for, for pigs. And so most of that, you know, a lot of the large sources, sources are collected there. But anyway, coming back to individual um, residences, um, the, um, the trick would be to get people to separate it um, at the source. So source separation is really important. Once it's in the gray bin, we can't separate it. It's going to H power, and it's going to get burned with everything else. And it's going to be reduced by 90% to 10% to ash. But we missed the opportunity you know, to do something with that. The tricky part is how do we how do we collect that and what's that going to cost? Um, again, the best thing to do is to not produce the waste in the beginning. <laughs> um, and so there are programs, and I know Nicole's involved with one in Chinatown where we try to reduce um, food waste. Right, so use all the food that you get. Don't let it rot. Um, Eat all the food, I guess, that you, that you order. <laughs> um, if you don't, make sure it goes to people. Make sure it goes to yeah. people, right? So there are programs like that where people are, you know, really doing that kind of stuff. So we don't want to end up in the gray bin. But produce, producing another bin of some other color that also gets picked up has really large uh, cost implications. Um, uh, so, you, so uh, you know, if you had another bin, it's going to have to collect it on another day. And one of the main issues is... Everything uh, except for the, well, the gray bin's picked up every week, right? We all get that pick, that service once a week. But your green bin and your blue bin are only connected, collected every other week. Mm -hmm. So what are you going to do with food waste? Food waste is putrescible, so we really don't want you to put it in the green bin because it's only, it's only picked up every two weeks. So there's going to be some odor and other issues in there and perhaps, um, you know, attract, attract and things we don't want attracted to rats and stuff. So, uh, or just flies and whatever. Um, so 
essentially, you know, we are at a situation where we need another weekly pickup. So that adds a really large <laughs> cost, actually. And then, you know, you've got to depend on uh, a willing public to, to be able to, to make that separation and put it in something else and, 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 and put it out, you know, another, another day of the week. And then we would have to have enough vehicles and enough. Uh, so is that off the table because of those cost barriers and that sort of inconvenience? No, it's not off the it's not off the table. Um, and actually, as it, um, I think we were talking about earlier, the city council does have a bill that's working its way through, and it hasn't hasn't been um, finalized yet. Um, bill 62, which is of uh, the food waste, um, and um, telling directing the department to start collecting food waste. Um, we um, we're hoping to do that as a pilot first, so that we can figure out what the whole program was going to cost. If we're going to need new trucks, we're going to definitely need new carts uh, to, to do that, um, probably. Um, or actually, we, we don't have uh, a, we, we do have sort of a draft pilot plan that would be a six month thing. And the bill may, um, may require us to do something in a year and come back with a report and say, this is what we recommend and this is what the cost would be. But initially, just to say, okay, we're going to pick up another new cart uh, once a week. We said this is $43 million a year as a giant number, right? So we're looking at some other ideas like putting food waste in a bag and putting the bag that's not, that, that can't be easily torn apart in the green bin. But then it's got to be there two weeks. So there, there's some, it's, it's, it's not easy. Um, that would then get dumped in there and, have, and we have to be separated. Mm -hmm. So when you think about recycling, it's, there's some dirty work going on when you think about doing uh, mixed recyclables, having to go to a processing plant and, and be separated. And if it's wet or there's contamination, it's really problematic. So, um, you know, again, our business, the, the refuse business, is a, is a messy business. And um, so the best thing to do is, is to do stuff up front and, and, and change, the way, <laughs> change the way we do things and not create you know, all, of this, uh, all of this waste. And we'll be happy, I'll tell you, we'll be happy to not have as much waste, to <laughs> not burn as much, make less electricity, that's fine, and make the landfill last forever, right? If, or have, you know, you can't go to no landfill because when you have a refuse to energy facility like H Power, in order to get a permit to operate that from the Department of Health and the EPA, you must have some place to put the ash. Right, right. It's a requirement. Well, Karen, I know that your your place right now is the place, and we've go ahead. I think. You oh no, I, I had a question to bounce off. Um, it has has it ever has a conversation ever happened and looked at county to county? I mean, are the other counties and their landfills at capacity? And as between the mayors and the counties, have they have those conversations or discussions or even been equitably looked at? You know, whether it be bringing more of their recyclables to H Power, which isn't at full capacity um, and, and has some room for growth, and then the same token, taking some of ours to the other landfills. I mean, I'm just wondering if that's ever been researched or looked at. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for that question. And and just about anything you can think of, you know, has been has been investigated uh, at one time or another, uh, including innovative new processes that theoretically make almost no you know no residuals, um, uh, and and doing transfers. And there was a pilot um, you might remember uh, where trash was going to be uh, bailed up and it was going to be shipped to Washington State. And um, they didn't, turns out, and they actually got a contract from the city. Uh, and it turns out that they didn't have all their permits in place. And it was, um, it was halted before any ever left uh, Oahu. And large volumes we got bailed and were stored for a while. And eventually, we took them all back and, and burned them at H Power. But um, things like that are very, are very difficult. I mean, again, I think. We need to live within our own means in a general sense, right? So if someone asked if we would take their rubbish and bury it at Waimanoa Gulch, we'd say no. <laughs> um, and so anybody else generally would say no, um, especially other islands in, in Hawaii. Some folks in, might have some property in Nevada and say, yeah, we can take this waste. But once you crunch the numbers, um, if you think about shipping and and carbon footprint and, and, and stuff like that, it, it really doesn't make sense. Um, 
I did want to mention one other thing, Najee, that we're doing that I think is really important and I sometimes forget to mention is one of the things that we're doing that I think is really big is, as you mentioned, most of the stuff that goes to Waimanalo Gulch is ash from H Power. And H Power does generate 10% of our energy and that is thought of as green energy. Um, renewable energy because we we'll always have refuse maybe unless we get to zero waste right <laughs> um, the uh, is we is this ash product is the main thing that goes there as you mentioned it's close to 70 percent um we we are initiating an ash recycling program and will be the second one the operator of our landfill is covanta and they were um, they recently purchased by an international company but they have one facility there's one facility in the united states that uh recycles ash into an aggregate product um aggregate is like gravel and it's used in roads and it's used in concrete and asphalt and and um, you can make a material out of ash that is a substitute could be substitute for a portion of the of the uh, aggregate and um, so we, our, our consultant recently uh, visited their, their facility, uh, which is located in Pennsylvania. It's the only one in the United States. And, um, and we are going, th going to be constructing um, such a facility here. So there's a potential it could reduce. How soon would that be? Um, it's probably going to take 10 years. <laughs> um, uh, but I'll tell you why in a second. But it could reduce the ash by 60%. So what it does is it goes through the treatment process. It extracts a lot of the metals and materials and leaves behind material that's, that's hard enough to be considered an aggregate. And it's been, you know, successful back there. So we're... We're convinced that we should move forward with this. Um, there's several steps. The reason it's 10 years is because we first got to make sure we could get it approved, um, both environmentally and, and by Department of Health, that it would be acceptable to use this material. Because if you don't have any end use for it, if, if it's not acceptable to use, then we, we wouldn't want to make it. And then there's several other steps before it could be come into operation. But these are long-term, you know, landfills are long-term. Um, Waste energy, you know, refuse is it's long term. So sounds like a long time, but, but. well, and in the meantime, Karen, your com your your community is bearing the brunt of this. You know, we talked about a lot about the cost of um, some of these other propositions, mm -hmm. but what has the cost been to your community? And sort of what would you tell people about the experience of of having to host this for so long? Well, you know, the, we, I think the words social social injustice and environmental injustice have, have been used and, and come up multiple times in this conversation. But there there are long time, and we actually do have um, a lot of, all of the utilities on our, our side of the island too. So it's not just the Why Not Only College Landfill. And, and to the point that the, the space was there and the way this island was developed and built and grew from decades ago. Um, the imprint was there, but it, it's compacted, right? And so I think the cost is on so many levels, the environmental, the social, and just that sentiment that why is everything on the west side? And um, and beyond that, there's there's health concerns. I mean, I think there's there's unknowns. People people have have you know to your point, there's landfills all over, but there's also that 30 year period after it's closed. And there's a reason for that because of the toxins and and cancer causing agents and the, all these things that are, are unknown. So those are the concerns and worries of our, our, our families. And we have fa the most concentrated families on our side. We have the, the population. And so there's some big concerns. A lot of it's emotionally driven, but for good reason. Um, when you hear that that experience, what is it? What is it? What do you think about for your community? And what have you been hearing from people coming to the neighborhood board about the prospect of hosting this? Well, the neighborhood board has not taken a position because it was it has not been presented. We awaited what the commission's findings would be. Um, I am very comfortable in saying, should it come in front of the neighborhood board, it will probably be a very large meeting, <laughs> and they'll come out. I, I completely mirror what uh, Karen is saying. Um, we've been through it. There was a landfill there, and like you said, they've been everywhere. Um, I, I can I'm very comfortable saying that the community will come out with full resistance because there's just so many things that we are still trying to, as with many communities, we're not 
you know, exclusive to any issues, but um, we're still trying to figure out issues with flooding, stream maintenance, um, you know, emergency preparedness, how to fix all those things and to add something that could impact all of those would be of huge concern. And, and then, of course, again, the water. Um, you know, I, the very few people that are aware or really know about the landfill proposal, I, I can't even express how passionate and, like you said, emotionally driven that they are. And because they've seen, it's older people They've seen all of those changes already, and we're still in an area where we have so much to fix that we're, to them, that would be just adding to an additional thought of, okay, how are we gonna manage this? So I, you know, it, it, it's a tough game, right? Because it's something we have to manage, it's something we have to figure out, and no community wants it because it is impacting. Karen's absolutely right, it's very, it's, it's social injustice, it's emotionally driven. And, you know, North Shore also, as in many areas, has a lot of cultural aspect that people are concerned about. Um, the cultural aspect is something everyone's still trying to hold on to. Still, there's still quite a bit of, you know, kupa aina and kupuna around that bring up, you know, don't, don't touch that. So it, it's definitely an educational process to Nichols comments is we definitely need to find a way to um, it is a it is a lifestyle shift as well like you're saying um, but that's not an easy task either getting people to change their way and oh it's just this one I'll just throw it in there you know just one and there's somebody else that's saying the same thing so I know the community would come out strong and I completely resonate what Karen's saying, I know that would be the case, that as they have come out strong with so many other issues. Well, how do we how do we work on that? You know, tomorrow is Earth Day, and it feels like something that we pay kind of a lot of lip service to, um, but making sure that we are not just that one. We are almost out of time, but I do want to get to each of you before we go. Um, tell us what are some concrete steps that we can each take to reduce that stream from, from the start? Sure. A simple one that does take some behavior change, but it's a simple thing. Bring your own utensils when you dine out. So our, uh, the single, the disposable foodware ordinance that the county passed is, it already requires restaurants to no longer automatically give utensils. And I'm sure we've all experienced that isn't fully um, enforced yet, but it's coming. And so just have yours in your pocket or in your bag, or if you're taking your takeout back to your office, for lunch, have utensils in your office. Uh, if food's coming into your home, you really don't need those condiment packets and those napkins. And then it saves our businesses money, right? They're not having to provide that stuff. That's just going to get used once and tossed. Mm -hmm. So I think that's a, that's a low-hanging fruit. Uh, one more I'll offer is around your food waste footprint. So, it, and I know so much about this and I'm not perfect. So I, actually that's the biggest umbrella is give ourselves room to grow with imperfection. It's not gonna all come at once. Uh, buy food a little differently. Um, don't buy so much at, at once when you're thinking about produce because that's when you tend to, to let the produce go bad. And then uh, keep encouraging our stores to offer bulk shopping options because then you can bring your, your own bag and you know get your pasta or your rice in something you can reuse instead of something you have to throw away. Those are great, great tips. Roger, how can people get engaged on this? Because we all have a stake in this. So we're all creating, uh, and we have to be brief because we only have a few minutes left. Um, do you mean with, with respect to the... The discussion to, as to where this should go. Yeah, where this should go. So the, the, our landfill advisory committee meetings are all, all open. Um, the last one will be in June. The date is actually not set yet. Um, so that's a public meeting. People uh, can uh, uh, attend that. It'll be in person and, and online. And uh, there's a, a time for people to speak. Um, you can get up to speed on everything on our website, and, and that's where the dates and stuff would be announced. Um, and I think it's important to note that once a landfill new site is named, um, there's still a long process. This is really still just the initial step. Uh, if you think about it, we'd have to um, uh, condemn a site. We'd have to procure. We'd have to go through environmental impact statement, which is a long process. 
with public input, evaluating cultural sites, all that kind of stuff. That could take, that'll take a couple years. Lots of opportunities for engagement at that time. Um, and, then, uh, and then we have to go through procurement and construction. And so it, that's a fairly long process. None of this is going to happen overnight. So there's a lot of time, I think, for engagement and for discussion, like with respect to Earth Day and how we, how we do, um, how much waste we produce as individuals. And in just a little bit of time we have left, I want to give you the last word. I just want, want the opportunity to, for thought to go into this on all, all levels on how long we keep our waste at, at the Lower Manala Gulch landfill, as well as what's the next step to, and where it goes. Okay, well, thank you so much. Mahalo to you for joining us tonight. Of course, we do thank our guests. Roger Babcock, Jr., Director of the City's Department of Environmental Services. Kieran Polk, Executive Director of the Kapolei Chamber of Commerce. Vice Chair of the North Shore Neighborhood Board, Raquel Achu. And Executive Director of Zero Waste Oahu, Nicole Chatterson. Next week on Insights, driving under the influence can have deadly consequences. Efforts to lower Hawaii's blood alcohol limit for drunken driving have hit roadblocks each legislative session. But with senseless tragedy still happening, should Hawaii's DUI laws be tougher? Please do join us then. I'm Yanji Denise for Insights on PBS Hawaii. Aloha.